Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Nancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Gambling with an Edge has a new sponsor. Hallelujah. Uh, namely, Predictit.org, which is a trading site operated out of Victoria University in New Zealand. To tell us more about this, today we'll be talking to Flip Fado, who is a senior marketing analyst for that site. Flip Fado, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thanks, Bob. Richard, how are you? We are well. We're, this is a site that you, bet, you buy contracts, which are somewhat like bets, on political events that are going to happen in the future. We are taping this on Thursday, September 26th, which, and this will be airing a week later. So if we talk about prices for such things as the ch- chances Elizabeth Warren will win the Democratic nomination or Trump may be impeached by December 31st or some such, those numbers will be different by the time you are hearing this. this is, these are active markets, which is part of the charm of the site. So don't assume that when you hear it, if we mention a particular price, that that price is active at that time. So Flip, this actually might be the first time we've ever interviewed someone named Flip, so this is a big deal for Gambling with an Edge. <laughs> Please tell us in general about how the predicted.org works. Sure. Well, your, your summary was right on. It's, it's a site uh, at predictit.org where users can sign up and fund an account to then trade legally within the United States uh, real money uh, futures contracts effectively, which, as you said, are, it's similar to betting, but it's, uh, it's basically traders are um, making a forecast or a prediction about a political outcome. It can be an electoral outcome. It can be a policymaking outcome like a law being passed. It can be uh, someone's polling numbers in a month. It can be whether Trump tweets about a trade war this week. It, almost, <clears throat> excuse me, almost anything you can imagine to do with um, primarily domestic but also uh, global geopolitical uh, affairs. And what's great about it and what offers a really interesting uh, opportunity not only for the traders but for just the public consuming this data is that if you go and you say, okay, I think that Elizabeth Warren is going to win the nomination, or I think Trump is going to be reelected, you might uh, enter a position on that prospect if the odds then go higher. In other words, the market kind of catches up to your forecast. You can choose to exit that position. Or if you think the price has gone too high, you can say, well, I'm not that certain. So you can buy and sell and trade in and out of these various positions over the life of the contract. And functionally how it works is each share, we call it, pays out uh, $1 to the correct side upon resolution. So if you take a simple one like which party will win the White House in 2020, uh, and it's currently trading at about $0.55 cents on the dollar for the Democrat, $0.45 cents for the Republican. If you went and bought the Republican contract at $0.45, cents, or 100 of them for $45, and that turned out to be true, then on Election Day 2020, that $45 would be we would become 100. If the Democrat were elected, the 45 would become zero. But again, if polling changes while you're holding that $45 position and Trump's numbers start doing better, you might see that tick up to 50, 55, 60. And you say, okay, that's enough. I want to book that profit, sell it, take my $15, $20 profit, whatever it is, and invest in one of the other you know, several hundred uh, actively traded markets on the site. Why is it right. only political? I mean, there's no um, uh, sports or uh, do you have things like uh, the Oscars or, or, or those types of, of contracts? We don't. The, the focus is uh, explicitly political, and uh, part of it comes down to it's simply the, the nature of the focus of the project, and part of it comes down to the way in which Predicted is able to operate legally in the United States, which is by virtue of... Uh, no action relief, really, or basically a letter from the federal regulators, the CFTC, saying that we will not treat these as regulated commodity futures products, which we otherwise would, uh, so long as you uh, restrain trading within certain 
uh, restrictions uh, to do with uh, position limits, number of traders in a market, but also importantly, there are topical restrictions. So they need to have to do with elections or other political and policy making uh, outcomes uh, and with a uh, uh, limited further exception toward uh, economic indices. Uh, but but it, it would not cover things like uh, uh, sporting event outcomes or Academy Awards uh, and, and things like that, which is why our focus is squarely on the, uh, uh, the political. But again, as I gave a couple examples earlier, that really can go way, way beyond, you know, who's going to win a particular electoral race to encompass uh, uh, a number of pretty interesting uh, and rapidly unfolding uh, events that, especially with sort of the increasingly circus-like atmosphere in D.C., uh, occupy a good, you know, good portion of the uh, attention span of the average trader, the average news consumer, the average, you know, citizen, uh, I think more so even than, the, than it would have a couple of years ago. Could you give us okay. some examples of some of the crazier uh, contracts that are currently in play? Uh, let's see. Well, it depends on, on how you define crazy, but we, we've got uh, a number to do with um, uh, Twitter activity, I think I alluded to earlier, but, you know, how frequently Trump will tweet. You know, there have been a few uh, pieces in the financial press recently about how the market reacts simply to Trump's volume of tweeting, that the markets get more nervous when he tweets more, because he, obviously he has turned Twitter into a bit of a policy making or at least policy announcing uh, outlet in a way that no president has done before. So uh, those can those can turn really wild because suddenly something like the impeachment Ukraine scandal will break and Trump will start tweeting like mad or he'll see something on Fox and Friends and it'll stir something within him to to really start tweeting like crazy. And we'll, we'll, we'll tie not only to tweet volume and frequency, but whether he tweets certain uh, topics. Uh, and so that that tends to capture whether traders think his attention in the next week is going to be more on, you know, a Democratic rival, more on the witch hunt and fake news media, or more on uh, uh, some actual policymaking uh, matter. So the Twitter markets are one that when we, when we initiated them a, a couple of years ago, we really did not expect them to become as robust and meaningful, not just in a volume uh, sense, but meaningful for, in terms of an actual insight into what the market, the predicted market of traders uh, forecasts in terms of the, the president's uh, uh, area of focus uh, in a given, given week. Um, but as, you know, as we get closer to the 2020 elections, too, and not just the presidential, we're adding more and more about the primaries, the presidential primaries, state by state, who's going to come in first and second, who's going to lead in the certain state poll, uh, what the balance of power is going to be in Congress, who's going to win particular races and uh, gubernatorial races, House and Senate, even state-level races, uh, you know, we have a number on whether certain people will be indicted on federal charges this year on James Comey, Hillary Clinton, you know, the whole cast of characters. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's really almost anything within your imagination to do with uh, political uncertainty. And, and a lot of these do come from outside the imagination of the predicted team, too. We get, we get suggestions from traders uh, every day, constantly. They're not shy on Twitter, by email, through the sites, commenting, uh, sections to uh, offer up their own suggestions. And, and uh, a lot of them are, are not suitable for launch, but a lot of the good ones that we, uh, that we do launch come directly from traders. So let's, let's go through fees a little bit. You mentioned a, a possible one on who's going to win the White House where the price was at a given time the Republicans 45 and the Democrats 55. So let's right. say two um, friends, but who are on opposite sides politically. One takes 100 contracts on the Democrats. One takes 100 contracts on the Republican. And so one's putting up $45, one's putting up $55. One of those is going to get one hundred dollars on shortly after the election. So the question right. is, what are the fees for each of those two people? So the fees are calculated based on realized gains. So let's say the person who bought the Democratic side for fifty-five dollars uh, turned out to be correct. Democrat is elected. 
uh, their profit would then be $45, and their fees upon realization, which is to say upon settlement, would be 10% of that profit, so $4.50. The losing side who, who banked on the Republican would pay no fees. Okay. And, and that is per, per contract, right, not per net for the day. I mean, let's say that you had 12 different contracts of different types that all settle on mm-hmm. the same day, uh, and you end up, you know, having winners and losers, but your net actually is zero, but you're still paying the fee on all the winning contracts. That's correct. You're paying it uh, on, a, on a per contract basis, in fact, a per, per share basis within that contract uh, for each realized gain. So if, you, if you're buying and selling all day long and gradually making money, you're incurring the fees in real time. If you then plunk down a big position and it promptly sells off and you take a bath on it, that doesn't claw back the fees. Okay. Right, okay. What would be the maximum number of contracts either person could buy on this? There's no set maximum other than the total number of contracts available for trade on the uh, on the site. So that's not one of the the uh, the no action relief restrictions. Those are on position limits. So you, so within a given contract, you can't buy a position larger than eight hundred and fifty dollars. And on uh, number of traders with active positions in a contract, can't be more than five thousand at any given time. But a given trader can go and open positions on. And I, I'm not certain of the number, but there are. I think a couple hundred uh, active markets at this uh, at this time, many of which have several nested linked contracts, and so that 850 limit would apply at the contract level, not at the market wide level. For instance, who will win the 2020 Democratic nomination? There are 20 some contracts within that market, uh, each of with, with each of which with its own uh, $850 position limit. And what so kind of volume? Uh, what kind of volume do you have? That really varies hugely uh, depending on the, uh, on the market. So some of them, uh, as I mentioned, the Twitter ones are generally quite, uh, quite popular. The, the high-level uh, presidential electoral markets uh, are quite popular, and they do uh, pretty consistently in the uh, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, of shares traded per day. I think our top contract right now, the 2020 Democratic nominee Lifetime has had uh, it's about 61 million uh, in volume. Of course, that one's been up for you know, a, a couple of years. Um, others will put out and will think we've got a really brilliant new, maybe slightly esoteric policy question we're acting, asking, but about some bill that's being hotly debated and it'll just go up and do nothing. And by nothing, I mean it might still get a few thousand traded, enough to generate liquidity and throw off a meaningful price signal. Um, but it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to predict sometimes, um, despite the fact that our site's in the prediction business. It's hard to predict what, uh, at least with total accuracy, which kinds of markets uh, traders are going to, to flock to. Sometimes it's the ones that uh, we really don't anticipate doing much that uh, turn out to be blockbusters and others that seem... Fantastic that that uh, are a little more um, uh, you know quiet. Okay, so I'm I'm still I wanted to follow up more on this eight hundred and fifty dollar limit. Mm-hmm. Let's assume there was a market where you could bet the yes or the no at fifty cents. Does that mean you could bet seventeen hundred contracts on either side? Yes. Okay. And when, um, so the next day or the next week, it's going to be maybe 48.52 one way or the other. So Mm -hmm. if that means you go over the $850 limit, do you cash the player out or the, uh, do you call them players? What do you call them? Uh, we call them traders, but no, the site would not traders. force a liquidation to keep you under the, the 850. The 850 is simply imposed at the time of purchase. You can't add to a position if it makes your, uh, you know, your, your new net length in that position uh, more than 850. But if you bought 85,000 shares at something selling at one cent, you, know, you could quickly have $10,000, uh, know, $10, $20,000 position in that contract, and it would not... Uh, it would not cash you out as soon as you hit eight hundred fifty dollars. 
or as soon as you went over it. Otherwise, especially if you, there'd be no market for the one or two, three cent things. As soon as they ticked up one cent, uh, they'd be liquidated, and that uh, you know obviously would um, severely uh, put a cap Handicap on cap liquidity. On, uh, yeah, exactly. And yeah, there'd, there'd be no no purpose to invest in any long shot because you'd, you'd have no uh, opportunity for an outsized payoff. Okay. Why the, the 850 limit? Uh, that is imposed by the no action letter from the CFTC. It's to keep it from being, uh, you know, effectively an unregulated or less regulated alternative to a designated contract market or another trading venue subject to the normal uh, regulatory framework of the, of the U.S. commodities law. Um, one of the one of the problems with this uh, for our listeners, um, just um, for example, today uh, I just noticed a couple of uh, what I thought were very good bets on um, that Michelle Obama and Oprah will not uh, run for president, um, mm-hmm. and I think they were today they're selling it like ninety two cents. Um, and often the good bets for, for professional gamblers are these big bridge jumper type bets because the public mostly likes to bet on the long shots. But if I can right. only bet $850, you know, but I'm laying 92 to 8 or something, I, I really can't get much money down at all. Um, that, on a, that's right. And especially for so, that, that effect that, that um, long shot bias effect is somewhat exacerbated when you have longer term markets too, because a lot of traders feel that, you know, if they, if they, as you said, if they have to put, they can only put down 850 and they're only going to make a 5% return and they've got to wait a year and a half to realize that. Whereas on a polling market or a Twitter market or a testify market or something, they may feel they've got an opportunity for 10, 20, 30% return in a day or in a week. Uh, then the you know even if it were a locked certainty that Michelle Obama as you said won't file to run for president in 2020, uh, they're not interested in tying up that much of their bankroll for that relatively small return and have to wait a year or more to receive it. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so let's say that I bet on the right side of this and I win and and I have won four hundred dollars on this contract. Um, is that my money to um, – can I withdraw it immediately? Do I have to leave it uh, there? You can. Do I have to turn it? What are the rules? Uh, no, that's, that's yours to keep. And is there a fee if I withdraw it? Uh, there is. There's, I believe it's 5% withdrawal fee Well, when you take the money back out, when you, you know, convert it to actual cash. And is okay, the only then... way to withdraw to credit card? Currently? Uh, I don't, I don't believe so. I think you can do it to a bank account, but honestly, that's not um, uh, my end of things, and I, 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 I wouldn't want to swear to that because I'm not, uh, I'm not involved in that end of the operation. Okay. Okay. So let's assume some of our listeners are have political opinions. Of course, if they don't, they probably would have turned this episode off a long time ago. <laughs> so assume that they have political opinions and they want to participate. And uh, they wouldn't mind throwing a few dollars towards gambling with an edge. If they sign up through our portal, what kind of advantage is it to them What kind of it, um, to do that? Right, so they go, and we've set up a, a special landing page at predictit.org slash promo slash edge, uh, and if they sign up that way, they will get a, a deposit match for their first deposit up to $20. So if they put in $20, they will immediately have $40 in credit uh, in their account. Uh-huh. And when they, when they spend that, if they spend it, then Richard and I get some some piece of that. Um very good. Uh, uh, I just so we will have a link, um, you know, in the in the show notes um, that'll take you to that page. But um, I, I actually I should have talked to uh, uh, 
John before about this, and this may not be your area at all, but do you know, uh, is there a requirement that they uh, buy some number of contracts before cashing out with that free money? I believe so, but yeah, you're right. It's it's not uh, my area, but yeah, I believe you can't simply put in the 20, it becomes 40, and then cash it out. Uh, the, right. The okay. I will. I would think would need to be invested, but yeah, John, John or someone else at, at Predictive would be able to answer that more authoritatively. Right. And for our listeners, I will get that clarified and uh, put it in the show notes uh, because. I know there are a bunch of you listening that are like, oh, I'll just deposit 20 and then cash out 40. And, uh, yeah, that would not be good for us or for them. And so please don't do that. <laughs> and we're, we're going to be talking about this on a regular basis. As, uh, as if they're sponsors, we talk about them during the commercial section. So we'll be passing out this information um, over the air in addition to in the liner notes. And since we just mentioned commercials, this seems like a great time for a commercial break. So we're going to get back to Flip in just a moment. And in the meantime, hear from our sponsors. Uh, we're not going to talk about Predicted.org as a sponsor today, maybe for obvious reasons, but we will be talking about them later um, on future shows. The South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In October, the promotion is free play with a kicker. Usually free play is eligible to be picked up Tuesday through Thursday weekly. In October, your normal free play amount may be picked up Monday through Wednesday, and if you pick that up, you get the same amount either Friday or Saturday of the same week. Do this four weeks in a row, meaning eight free play pickups, and you get a double size free play pickup on Monday, October 28th. So whatever your normal pickup amounts, instead of four times whatever your amount is, this time it's ten times. So it's a, it's a significant increase. The free play amounts are relatively small. If you go in and just pick up your free play, then your play for the month will be pretty small and your future mailers will be affected. That's just kind of the way it works. The next free video poker class on October 8th, 12 o'clock noon, is 9-6 Bonus Poker Deluxe. Bonus Poker Deluxe is very much like Jacks are Better, except... Four of a kind pay 80 for one rather than 25 for one. Balanced by two pair getting one for one rather than two for one. These two factors balance each other out fairly closely. Uh, nine six jacks would be 99.54. Nine six bonus poker deluxe would be 99.64. So it's about the same percentage there is a higher variance to the bonus poker deluxe simply because four of a kind is a relatively rare event. It happens about every 420 hands on average uh, with some fluctuation. If this is a day that you're getting a lot of four of a kind, then bonus poker deluxe is a much better game to be playing than jacks are better. If this is a game where four of a kinds take a vacation, from your machines, you would rather be playing Jacks are Better than Bonus Poker Deluxe. Unfortunately, you do not have this information until after your session is over. The strategy is similar between the two games, but there are differences primarily because of the amount you get for to pair affects strongly how many straights you go for. It may not seem obvious, but after the class, you'll understand that. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. In the very near future, there will also be a pro membership, which gives you 
extra advantages, especially correction on games like Ultimate X and Quick Quads. This is still under construction as we tape this, but we'll be talking about it significantly in the near future. The game of the week is Face Card Frenzy. You can play this game anywhere from six coins per line to 10 coins per line, with the odds improving for the player as you increase your bet. In this game, full houses, quads, including jacks, queens, kings, and aces, return a lot more than the full houses and quads without those. To make the math work, all pay schedule categories are bumped up, meaning you need an entirely new strategy to play this game. In addition, if you play it for six coins, it's going to be a different strategy than playing it for seven coins, different than eight, different than nine, different than ten. It's not hard to work these out, but it takes a bit of effort and uh, something you need to prepare before you go to the casino if you wish to play it at maximum benefit. All right, we're returning to Flip Pado, who is a senior marketing analyst at predicted.org. On the site, you have an insight newsletter. Tell us about that. Uh, well, this is basically where traders can come to get some additional uh, thoughts. Uh, there's a weekly uh, called the Predictable Newsletter that's put out uh, by the team, sort of looking at what uh, uh, some in focus or heavily traded markets have been uh, for, for the prior week and, and what's sort of in focus in the upcoming week. It takes a look at uh, recent price movement and some of our uh, most uh, most heavily traded markets, but also introduces traders to some markets they might not be aware of. We sometimes focus on a an international uh, key election uh, or other, um, you know, just slightly off the beaten path market that folks who may be squarely focused on the presidential or on some other aspect of domestic politics might not be aware of, and yet uh, through that sort of new market discovery often find some additionally uh, interesting opportunities. So it's, it's a good way to get uh, a little bit of commentary and, and updates and, and um, to discover some, some new things on the site you might not be aware of. So there's a comment section on this as well? On, on uh, notes, there is. There. There is, yeah. I'm not sure how um, actively uh, used that is for uh, the commenting. You'll, you, you'll see if you go into, especially some of the more highly traded markets, that the comment section is extremely lively uh, on, on predicted, um, but not a lot of that uh, activity seems to happen on the, on the newsletters. People more enjoy, I think, the back and forth and you know, I won't say, well, so let's say uh, playfully adversarial nature of the discussion between the two sides on any given proposition on the actual um, the trading pages. Well, a lot of yeah. sites that have political commentary, I would not use the word playful. <laughs> it's, a, um, it's a charitable characterization. <laughs> the, uh, if you get a strong Trump supporter and a strong Trump detester, we'll call it, uh, trying to have a civil conversation about anything to do with Trump, it is basically impossible. Uh, they are yelling and screaming in short order. Does that kind of thing happen on your site as well? You know what, it, it does. You get, as I said, you get lively discussion, uh, but it is of a different character than I think, it, you know, folks who are used to seeing political back and forth on, you know, comments on a news site, political news site, or on Reddit or Facebook or other social media. It's less of that. It's less of the sort of, you know, partisan sniping. Trump is terrible because of X. No, he's great because of Y. It's more to do with people convincing each other that uh, a contract is under or overpriced. So that will still sometimes devolve into the more partisan, you know, this is overpriced because crazy liberals think X or crazy conservatives think Y and they're too blind to realize it. But it, it, more so comes down to, I mean, I, I, from a trader's perspective, if you're trying to actually glean something useful from the comments, it becomes a game of, okay, who's here offering genuinely good commentary, breaking something down 
and offering me insight or analysis I don't already have that I can use, and who is simply, uh, you know, they call them the pumpers, who is trying to, to artificially inflate or deflate the price because they want to buy in or, or sell uh, at a price that the market won't allow them to yet. So, you know, there's, there's obviously some incentive for people to give exactly the opposite uh, thesis or analysis from what they genuinely believe so they can get in or out uh, at a more favorable price. Again, this, is, this becomes less of an issue in the really high volume markets because whoever may read a misleading comment or insight uh, is less likely to, to steer uh, the price in a meaningful way when you've got a really deep order book. Uh, but you still see a, a, a good amount of that. Or at least you see people attacking other comments as simply, you know, false pumps in one direction or another. So I'm, um, uh, I, I'm just looking at some of the most um, active markets right now. And um, the, uh, what I'm curious about is uh, there's, there's something that says, where's the smart money? Well, for, so first of all, do you have what you would call professional traders, people that are clearly playing with an edge and making um, more than just a few dollars at this? Yeah, there are, there are people who have made trading on predictor their full-time jobs, and there are folks who do quite well at it. Uh, in terms of whether they're playing with an edge, I mean, I, I think a lot of traders develop a, uh, a, an edge through to sort of the tapestry effect of spending a lot of time analyzing these markets, analy analyzing the underlying fundamentals of, again, whether it's Twitter activity or, uh, you know, a whip count in Congress. Um, in terms of whether folks play with the, an act, you know, what would be deemed more of an unfair edge, you know, is the congressional staffer uh, to Mitch McConnell, who knows someone's going to be put on the floor next week, trading on that knowledge. Uh, that we aren't aware of. Uh, however, it's worth noting that that the site does not, and this is in the you know, disclaimers in terms of conditions, does not, uh, you know, take efforts to steer away people who may have specialized knowledge, and to a certain degree. You want people with, with varying degrees of knowledge in the markets. That's, the, that's how markets generate a, a, a more useful price. That you don't want there to be a systematically unfair edge. And in this case, we do have the protections and benefits of the Stock, stock Act, the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act, which does apply even to prediction markets. It prevents you know, elected officials and their staffers from personally profiting off of knowledge they have about future events um, by virtue of their, uh, their job functions and responsibilities. So the same way that someone can't go and trade, you know, an FDA uh, scientist can't go and short the stock of a company whose new cancer drug he knows is about to be uh, turned down. Uh, that same staffer who knows what bill is going to be put on the floor next week can't go and, and trade on that knowledge on uh, predicted. So it's federal law that prevents them from doing it. The site does not independently take effort to enforce the Stock Act, but it, it does at least give us some, uh, some assurance that uh, that either is not happening or it's only happening by congressional staffers who are happy to brazenly break federal law. Um, but yeah, I think no, your, I, your I, primary, yeah. Yeah, no, I wasn't but, concerned about insider trading. I just was yeah. wondering, are there you professionals who are <laughs> – well, no, because I think the price um, – insider trading, I think, will allow the price to find the right mark um, if that money comes in, right? Uh, it, it, it will. Presumably. Uh-huh. We seem to have lost flip. All right. So what we're going huh. to do now is usually at the end of our show, Richard and I talk about something interesting that we've seen. Hi, sorry, guys. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, Good. now we Welcome can. Welcome back, Flip. <laughs> Great. The, the, um, the conference line booted me off there for a sec. Ah, okay. Right. So um, uh, you were saying so, that the price would, um, with insider trading, the, the correct price would be discovered, right? It, it would, uh, although it might be diluted to some extent, again, because some, uh, uh, one individual who knows the outcome ahead of time, it would still be restricted to that $850 position limit. So if it's a high-volume contract, that would be a somewhat diluted signal. Uh, but still, it would help 
the market find the correct price, but it's still you know, not necessarily something you want, only because if, if, if it becomes apparent that you have a number of players in there with an unfair advantage or an advantage that the, you know, an ordinary trader can never hope to match, uh, then that's a disincentive toward the general public from, uh, from participating. So you know, as I alluded to earlier, we're not, we're not aware of, of stuff like that going on, but certainly uh, you do have varying levels of confidence and accuracy among uh, different traders like you do in any market and and uh, because of that we we do see uh, some folks doing uh, doing very well do you uh, happen to know if you have any uh, computer automated trading uh, it's not allowed uh, by predict it we do sometimes see it happening and uh, it's, it's not um, an activity that I'm directly involved with, but I'll, in, in speaking to the folks who are, uh, you know, I hear that uh, once in a while they'll see some some bot or scripted uh, activity, and I think they're generally able to, to shut it down pretty quickly. It, it leaves enough traces of itself uh, versus you know how long it takes to manually enter uh, a new trade uh, to enter or exit a position. Uh, but but in terms of a site policy, it's something that that is not permitted on on predicted. So, and then I, I had one more question, um, and, and that was, so uh, there's this box that says, where's the smart money going? And it says 26% of Predicted's top traders have sold this contract in the last 24 hours. And, and that co contract is basically, will Trump be impeached by the end of 2019? And the uh, yes is 40 cents and the no is 61. So my question is, have they sold the yes or sold the no? Uh, I have to confess, I'm not familiar with the box that you're talking about, though, so I can't, I can't weigh in on that, uh, oh, okay. that specific so, example. This is, in other words, it's saying that 26 – sorry, can you repeat the number that you're seeing in the, this alert? Yeah, so if you click on trends, the first box you see is what are the top traders doing? And um, it says that 26% of the top traders have sold this contract in the last, uh, I forget what, how, in, in, just recently. Um, uh -huh. But it doesn't say whether they're selling the yes or selling the no. I guess you can only buy, right? So... Uh, uh, correct. Yeah. You, you, so even on a contract that has multiple outcomes, like who will the nominee be, it's just a series of linked yes or no's. So if yeah, so they're if they're saying 26% have bought, they probably mean predicted yes on whatever the outcome is you know being referenced. Well, it says they've sold the contract, not bought the okay. contract. That's, that's okay. So that's the right. confusing part. Okay, gotcha. So sold, uh, and I'm, I, I say I'm not certain whether they mean both sold a long position or you know closed out a yes, or bought a new no position. That would be my guess is that they mean one way or another, taking an incremental position on it not happening, uh, either by selling a yes or buying a no. Yeah, okay. Several of these contracts are correlated with others. Yes. In that um, some are totally independent, or appear to be, but some are for example, um, Elizabeth Warren being the Democratic nominee and, and a woman being the Democratic nominee, of right. which it's slightly more to bet a woman, so you get there's some small chance that uh, Kamala Harris, Tulsi Gabbard, um, Oprah, Hillary Clinton, whoever. But they're highly – but they're, it's mostly – Elizabeth Warren is giving the value of that. So mm -hmm. if, if you have uh, a really strong opinion, you can get around this $850 by doing several correlated markets. Is that, is that a reasonable that, assumption? That's true. So if you found a market that was a, a rough proxy for one that you've maxed out on, as you said, uh, in this case, what will the gender of the Democratic nominee be? You would have a separate $850 limit 
uh, to invest in that contract. Uh, and now if one of the other women, Kamala Harris or whomever else, sort of has, a, has an upswing, an uptick, it would become a less, you know, less of a proxy. Uh, but at the moment where she is, as you said, occupying most of the odds of the, uh, uh, the other contract of a female being nominated, uh, it becomes a somewhat of a better proxy. We saw something similar in 2016 where there were several markets, um, you know, who will, who will be elected president, which party will win the White House, uh, who will be elected vice president, and what will the gender of the next president be. Come election day, those four were all identical markets, effectively. But when they'd been launched many months or a year or more earlier, they were all very different prospects. Uh, but by the time... You know, by the time it came uh, down to the final, um, the final leg of the race, they they had become effectively perfect proxies for each other. So, so there are sometimes opportunities to uh, to do that to put more money on um, on a prospect that is, if not identical, uh, quite similar. In you have, historically, you have, go ahead. Historically, prediction markets seem to have been a better predictor than merely polls. Um, right. Do you find that true, or am I? Yeah. I, I think they tend to be better. It doesn't mean that they're perfect. Uh, I think they tend to be better, and they tend to digest the information more quickly. So we've had Warren out in front of Biden for over a month, uh, whereas the only polls where she's been leading have just come in within the last couple of days. Uh, and we've now got her way, way in front, 51 to 22, or uh, based on the current Something numbers. Like that, yeah. Um, but uh, it, it does seem to, that all the information, whether it's fundraising numbers, crowd sizes, uh, anecdotal, more qualitative stuff, the, the prediction market is able to synthesize and, and distill all that in real time in a way that polls uh, really can't. So whether they're long-term more accurate, they are at very least much more responsive uh, in real time. And we actually found in 26, uh, sorry, uh, 2018 that um, there was a professor uh, who did an analysis of predicted accuracy versus uh, 538, Nate Silver's you know, political forecasting site, and found that... Uh, Forgive me, I'm going to forget which house, but for one of the houses, 538 was slightly uh, more predictive. I think it was for the House of Representatives and for the Senate races, predict it was slightly more accurate in their predictions. And so that's, of course, a brand and a, and a data analysis, you know, super power that, that sort of prides itself on being poll driven. Polls are a key input, but then they apply a lot more sort of clever, sophisticated data science to to adjust from those polls and come up with the, uh, you know, ostensibly industry leading uh, forecast. Uh, and this, uh, this paper suggested that predicted seems to do at least as well, if not a bit better in a lot of cases than, uh, than 538. And that, that only seems to improve as the sophistication of the traders, the size of the trader population, the diversity of that trader population grows as well. So, uh, and that's despite the fact that we do still have a couple of these artificial structural limitations like the, uh, the position size limits, which does tend to dilute the smart money signal a little bit. Uh, but even with those uh, limitations in place, it does seem to be uh, as good or better uh, a, a source of, of forecasting, political forecasting, than, than anything else out there. Now, if a, there's political science departments in every university, at least some of them are studying the 2020 election. Presumably, your company is creating data that would be useful to them. Uh, how, right. Do you make this available to them, or are they? We on do. Their own? Uh, in fact, we have, uh, we have research partnerships with dozens of uh, professors and universities throughout the country that use the uh, that use the uh, data, the price and volume data in various ways, and uh, it'll be interesting to see after the 2020 election what kind of body of research emerges from that, because especially with the, with the increasingly large and complex portfolio of markets, many of which, as you mentioned, are correlated uh, oftentimes in interesting ways, 
this will be really interesting to see what kind of insights, not only academics, but I would imagine um, well-funded political campaigns are able to, uh, to glean from this. I mean, you can see in real time as someone's poll numbers improve and then they go up in the nominee market, then you'll see the odds of who, which party wins the White House will sometimes gyrate too. And it tells you a little something about which candidates the market really sees as being more electable versus Trump in a head-to-head. -head. So you can sort of make these synthetic um, uh, hypothetical markets of if Warren is the nominee, how likely is it that she'll beat Trump? And compare that to if Biden is the nominee, how likely is it that he'll uh, defeat Trump? Um, uh, and it, so it, it offers a whole range of these kind of insights that uh, uh, whether the, they turn out to be correct or not, uh, at least show in a pretty unique way what traders uh, are thinking, not just about this specific question being asked, but by making these comparisons to other markets, related markets in real time, uh, what that means for these you know, various hypotheticals going forward. In the 2016 election, there was uh, most U.S. In, or I think all U.S. intelligence agencies came to the opinion that the Russians – actively affected the U.S. election. I think this position has been denied by the White House, but the intelligence officers say it's true. You don't have any contracts on outside interference. Is that because it's hard to come up with a question that is um, yes or no? Or, but that seems to be a burning question and one that would be of interest. Yeah, it would be of interest, and, and you got the answer exactly right. It would be hard to structure that and draft rules that would be ambiguous. Even looking back at 16, it would be hard now to write rules that everyone would agree on how to settle the market. As you said, the White House uh, insists that that is not the case, and, and I'm sure a lot of uh, Trump supporters would as well. So you, you always want to have rules and a settlement source that are fully uh, unambiguous, and we found that uh, – even when you're pretty certain you've got that, um, especially in the era of Trump, uh, things find a, find a way sometimes of you know, having the coin land on the edge. So we, we try and avoid any, uh, any possible um, ambiguity uh, in that settlement source. It's not to say that foreign meddling in the 2020 election is not something that we may put up markets on, certainly open to suggestions. As you said, it's, it's an area of intense focus and interest and concern. Uh, to most, if not all, Americans. Uh, so if we can find uh, ways to capture that uncertainty, uh, we certainly will. All right. We're, we're getting near the end of our time uh, with Flip Pinot. We uh, have – Rich, did you have any more questions that you wanted to throw his way? Nope. Nope. Uh, I, as right. I say, we will – I will talk with John and we'll get it worked out, the uh, – the actual terms on the sign-up bonus for people who sign up through our link. Uh, and as I say, we'll have those in the show notes, and we'll also talk about them next week. And this John that Richard keeps referring to, it's a man named John Phillips, who it seemed like you could call somebody like that flip too, but he's <laughs> the CEO of Predicted.org, and so his decision presumably is final. Uh, thank you very yes, much. Yes, he will have the right answer. Uh, presumably, uh, we very possibly will be talking to you in the future. Uh, Richard and I are looking forward to this relationship with you. We thank you very much for your time today. Yep, great chatting with you. Thanks so much for having me on. So, Richard, we have started recently a section of where you or I talk about interesting things that we've found in the last week or three. Do you have something to share with our listeners? Right. Uh, I call it recommended things we found that we recommend to the listeners. Uh, mine That's this I call week, it that too. Yeah, right. Mine this, this week is a place called Shang Artisan Noodle. And um, this is a noodle house in uh, Chinatown, um, and I went there the other day, and it's one of those very small hole-in-the-wall places. They've got a bar that sits over the, an open kitchen uh, where you can watch a guy 
pulling dough and making noodles all day long. And so the noodles are made fresh, um, and it only has about eight, six, eight, ten tables plus the the bar overlooking the kitchen. Um, but they had just excellent uh, Chinese noodles. So um, it's called Shang Artisan Noodle. It's at 4983 West Flamingo, uh, right by a Capriati's at Flamingo and De- Decatur. You know that area. And, uh, yeah, I thought it was quite good, and I will definitely be going back. So that is my recommended for the week. All right. So Decatur is a little bit south of the Chinatown area, excuse me, a little bit west, and Flamingo's a little bit south. Most of the Chinatown centers around near Arville and Spring Mountain, I think. But it's it spread out quite a bit. Uh, yes. Another thing I wanted to ask you about, I don't know if you're ready for this. If not, you can bleep this section. Uh, you went to a play recently that is will be closed by the time uh, this airs, but it sounded very interesting in concept. It had to do with a an oaky dinner, o- oaky supper club. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, I went to a show called the Oakey Family Supper Club, and um, this is what they call uh, both immersive and interactive theater, which is a trend I'm very interested in currently. And, and these are shows, immersive is a show where you are in the show. Sometimes it invo- involves uh, going from room to room, following cast members around. Um, and interactive means you as the audience member, actually people in the cast talk to you. Um, so uh, as I say, I'm very interested in these types of shows. A lot of them tend to be horror, um, which are the, not the ones I'm interested in so much. But um, anyway, so this one was called the Oki Family Supper Club. And basically, you are invited to a dinner. And you are part of this family that is having this dinner. And the night of the show, the day of the show, I was emailed and told who I was to the family, how I related to that family. And I was told to go down to the Greyhound bus station uh, downtown in Las Vegas, uh, where I would meet, you know, one of the members of the family who would pick me up to take me to the dinner. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, the, you know, there is a kind of uh, bare bones structure to the story of the show, but the rest of it is all just kind of what happens with this family and, and the relationships between the people. Um, so anyway, I had a great time. Uh, and these types of shows, I will certainly be Uh, going to as often as possible. These particular people who put on this show are all performers in Cirque du Soleil shows. So um, they only have Sunday and Monday nights off. So the the show was only on Sunday and Monday night. So, um, you know, I hopefully they'll be doing more like it in the future and, and I will be going. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the actors in there was uh, Darren Piquera who is the manager of the Las Vegas Theater Hub, which is w- arguably the top improv group in Vegas. And so by the time I figured that out, it was the show was sold out. But this sounded like yeah. a lot of fun. If, um, if you had made the decision, Richard, that whatever character you had was an alcoholic, and so you played it that way, would this would the cast have gone along with you and, and dealt with you as an alcoholic uh, uncle or oh, whatever yeah. it was your position? Oh, so. oh yeah. And you know, one of the things that was interesting is everybody there thought that some people were actors that were just guests, and and vice versa. So part of my story was that the daughter of this family is my ex-wife. And people kept coming up to me going, are you going to be okay that she's here? And, and, I, and I kept saying, yeah, yeah. And then she came down and sat next to me at the dinner table. 
And I was like, really? You're going to, you know, come sit right next to me? And um, anyway, I thought for the entire evening that she was one of the actors, and it turned out she wasn't. She, she was just a guest as well. So, um, but yes, if I had decided to play it as an alcoholic, then they would have just gone with it, yeah. Boy, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, both Richard and I are in this improv troupe, and uh, for me, that sounds like uh, it would be a delight to participate in. So I hope I find out about the next time they do it early enough to um, decide. There's not many places. It was like eight or 10 or 12 people are allowed to come. And yeah, only yeah I think shows. only eight guests. Yeah. I mean, because it's, it's only... a dinner. We all sat around one big table, you know. So uh, there's eight guests and uh, five or six cast members. Right. Right. Uh huh. Very good. That really sounds interesting. And um, hopefully I get to do it next time. I'm looking forward to it. In the meantime, I'm glad we have a new sponsor. See how it works. Uh, The Predictus.org sounds interesting to play with if you have any interest at all in politics. In the meantime, uh, thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day.